I don't know if you've noticed it or not. I trust you have. But we are living in unprecedented days in America. In fact, I cannot remember a time in my life when these days have been more unique, more uncertain, and more unprecedented in relationship to human history since I have been alive. You see, years ago, the secularists of America targeted this country to try to make Christianity become extinct in this nation. They failed. Then they turned their targets toward neutralizing Christians in our culture. They have somewhat been successful. And now it appears that they have their sights set on silencing men and women, teenagers of the faith who are born-again Christians and are supposed to be courageous in the times in which we live. Well, the verdict is stood out, and I pray that we will never, never, never be silenced. But why are we where we are in America, and why are we where we are in the world today? I want you to think with me today specifically for a moment about our own nation called the United States of America. Lawlessness abounds nationally. Racial unrest and violence is erupting endlessly. Marriage and family are being redefined completely. Sexuality is degrading limitlessly. The killing of the unborn is being accepted and ignored shamelessly. Political promises are being broken repeatedly. Biblical authority and infallibility are being mocked defiantly. And religious freedom is losing ground continually. National security is now the number one conversation in America. And when you look at where America is, what is the answer? What do we do now? And where is our hope? And then, when you look at matters across the world, unquestionably and undeniably, these are frightening times. Iran is now being empowered by our own nation. Israel is becoming marginalized by many across the world. Russia is being ignited and permitted to become a world leader. Syria and Iraq are in complete disarray. Seven million refugees alone from those two countries are infiltrating the rest of the world, resulting in today what is called the greatest humanitarian crisis in our world. ISIS and Boko Haram are on the move, showing no reserve or no retreat. In fact, we know that women are being raped, girls are being sold into sex slavery, Christians and others are now being beheaded all because of those horrendous groups of people. We know as well from the events across the world, beginning with Paris a couple of weeks ago, that now the fear has come not only on that part of the ocean, on the other side of the ocean, but right here in our own land. And since the Russia jet was shot down, just weeks ago, travel now nationally and internationally places fear or uncertainty on each one of us. If you don't know it, you better know it today. The world is extremely dangerous. But I want to remind us all of something spiritually today. The world is acting just like the world is supposed to act. America is acting just like America is supposed to act because the vast majority of America and the vast majority of the world does not know Jesus Christ in a personal way, and they are acting 
lost. The global population of this world is now 7.28 billion people. And missiologists say that over 3 billion of those people have absolutely no knowledge, none to our ability to ever know about Jesus Christ at all. We know that according to many of those who study this day in and day out, they will tell you that just over 1 billion people in the world would testify that they know Christ like we evangelical Christians say that we know Christ in a personal relationship. They would say as you look at the America that we live in, out of the 322 million Americans alive today, three out of four would not testify of having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Oh, I'm telling you today, we are living in desperate times. And in these desperate times, I want to call us today to do something that is so needed and so much overdue in our world today, especially in the church. I want to call us today to have a conversation with God about our nation. That's what I want to talk about this morning, a conversation with God about our nation. Now, in a moment, I'm going to read from the book of Nehemiah. And so if you'll get a copy of God's Word, I want you to turn with me to that passage of Scripture. In fact, I'm going to read in a moment from the first chapter of the book of Nehemiah. But even while you're turning the pages of God's Word or scrolling up, if you're using an electronic device today, let me give to you just a word that is very, very important to understand what you're about to read. In a moment, you're going to hear about a story that happened 446 years before Jesus ever came to this earth. Seventy years of captivity had just concluded where God's people had been taken away from Jerusalem into a foreign and a distant land called Babylon. They had been under the judgment of God, and they ignored God for years after years after years, and God finally said, I've had it and I'm going to put you under judgment. And so God deported the vast majority of them, and they lived in exile some 70 years in a land called Babylon. But now in this specific year, 446 years before the Lord came, the Persians had now replaced the Babylonians ruling the world, and King Cyrus had now left a door open for the Jews to once again return to their homeland called Jerusalem. Well, one of his servants mentioned here in the book of Nehemiah is Nehemiah himself. Now, Nehemiah was a cupbearer to King Cyrus. Those years and also while Babylon was in control, he was there serving the king. And his role in serving the king, specifically King Cyrus, he would be the cupbearer to the king, meaning that whatever the king drank, he would drink it before the king drank it in case someone had the intent to poison the king. Not the kind of job that you'd want to sign up for, but he was involved in the national security of its leader. So with that background, we look into the pages of God's Word, Nehemiah chapter 1. And I want us to stand in honor of God's Word today. We're going to read together 11 verses in the Scripture. And I want us to stand, and as you stand with me, I'm going to read Nehemiah 1, verse 1 through verse 11, which is the entire chapter of God's Word here in the book of Nehemiah. Reading from the Holman Christian Standard Bible, would you give attention to the reading of the Word? The words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah. During the month of Kislev, I'm going to talk about that in a moment, in the 20th year when I was in the fortress city of Susa, Hananiah, he tells us who he is, one of my brothers, arrived with men from Judah, and I questioned them about Jerusalem and the Jewish remnant 
that had survived the exile. How long had the exile been? 70 years. They said to me, here's the report. The remnant in the province who survived the exile are in great trouble and disgrace. Jerusalem's wall has been broken down and its gates have been burned down. When I heard these words, this is Nehemiah speaking, I sat down and wept. I mourned for a number of days, fasting and praying before the God of heaven. I said, now here's his conversation with God. All right, all that leading up to the conversation. Now here's the conversation. Are you with me? Say yes. Yes. Yahweh, the God of heaven, the great and all-aspiring God who keeps his gracious covenant with those who love him and keep his commands, let your eyes be open and your ears be attentive to hear your servant's prayer that I now pray to you day and night for your servants, the Israelites. I confess the sins we have committed against you. Both I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted corruptly towards you and have not kept the commands, statutes, and ordinances you gave your servant Moses. Please remember what you commanded your servant Moses. If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and carefully observe my commands, even though your your exiles were banished to the ends of the earth, I will gather them from there and I will bring them to the place where I chose to have my name to dwell. Now, where was the place that he chose to have his name to dwell? Jerusalem, okay? Verse, Verse number 10. They are your servants and your people. You redeemed them by your great power and strong hand. Please, Lord, Let your ear be attuned to the the prayer of your servant and to that of your servants who delight to revere your name. Give your servant success today and have compassion on him in the presence of this man. At that time, I was the king's cupbearer. Now, Father, I pray in Jesus' name today That whether someone is watching online, whether someone is watching on television, people in this room, wherever they may be on a simulcast today, I pray that the hand of God and the power of God will speak to them about their own life and about the soul of our nation. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Now let me give you just a little context here for a moment. If you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. It's not going to be on the screen, but it will help you understand what's happening here in Nehemiah 1. I want to talk about it in relationship to the months compared to the Jewish calendar. He said in the month of Kislev, that is November, December of 446 B.C. 446 B.C. in November to December And you find here that Nehemiah becomes aware of the problem in Jerusalem at that time, and he begins to pray. And then in chapter 2, verse 1 of Nehemiah, he refers to the month of Nisan, which is not talking about the make of a car, but it's talking about a month of the year. And in that, he talks about that being March and April in our day and time. So remember, he becomes aware of the problem in November of December, 446 years before the Lord came. Months passed, about four months passed, and he comes to March and April of 445 B.C., and Nehemiah is released, and he's sent back to Jerusalem on a mission for God. We know later on in the book that it was in 445 B.C. in the month of Ab, meaning July and August, A few months later, that Nehemiah starts rebuilding the wall around Jerusalem to secure the city. And then we know that for 52 days, he built that wall. And in those 52 days, that wall was completed in the month of Elul from August to September of 445 B.C. You see, the Bible records are clear to us 
because they record to us that Israel has been a nation for many years, ever since its original its origination. It has experienced joy, gladness, blessing, restoration, but it's also experienced deep moments of disgrace, deep moments of persecution, slavery, pestilence, death, and captivity. And even more recently, in the 1930s and the 1940s, if you ever go to Jerusalem or if you ever go to, to uh, Washington, D.C., and you go to one of the Holocaust museums in one of those two major cities of the world, you will be able to witness and you'll be able to see pictures, stories, film on six million Jews that were murdered by Hitler and the German army. It's hard to believe that some of you were alive even while that was going on. And some of you were, of course, very small children if you were alive in that day. But whatever happens in Israel still to this day is the focus of the world. It still is. When you go to that country and you know what you're surrounded by that country and or that what surrounds that country, you feel like you're in the middle of the powder keg of the world. And you know why you feel that? Because you are. You are. Even the prophet Ezekiel speaks to it over in chapter 14, verse 14. He talks about some of those turbulent times. He said there's a time that even if these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in this city, in this region, they would deliver only themselves by their righteousness. This is the declaration of the Lord God. Meaning what? God would not withhold his judgment hand even if those three men were there. He would deliver them. But he wouldn't deliver the people of God because of the judgment of God upon the people. You see, mercy comes, mercy goes. Judgment comes, judgment goes. And when you look at the nation of Israel, and you look at even through the eyes of, of the writer Nehemiah, you see the work of God and you look at the parallels of that to America, and you look and learn about our own nation in relationship to how God has worked before in a nation, that's the conversation that I want to have with you today. And that's the conversation that I want all of us to have with God today if we've not had it yet here today. I want to build this on three statements about America today. I want to urge you that if you're a note taker, take notes. If you're not a note taker, remember this. First of all, God has a sovereign plan for America. Do you believe that this morning? God has a sovereign plan for America. You see, just as God has a sovereign plan for Israel, God has a sovereign plan for America. God is sovereign. What does that mean? That means that God is in charge of all. You believe that this morning? He is in charge of all. By his nature and by his actions, God is in charge. God is Lord. God is King. And any ruler in this world serves only by the will of the God who is sovereign. The book of Daniel records when Daniel told Nebuchadnezzar right before he was put out to pasture literally because of his arrogance toward God. God reminded Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 4 verse 26 of two words that we need to never forget. Heaven rules. What does that mean? Earth does not dictate to heaven. Heaven dictates to earth. We don't tell heaven what to do, and we don't tell anybody in heaven what to do. Heaven tells us what to do. Even earlier in the book of Daniel, which is a great book to talk about the activity of God in a nation. But Daniel reminds us that it's 
God in chapter 2, verse 21, he says, he changes, God changes the times and the seasons. He, God, removes kings and establishes kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. Oh, I want you to know today that God has a sovereign plan for our nation called America, and God will fulfill his sovereign plan in our nation. Not one ruler will stop the sovereign plan of God. It is God alone who will raise up the next president of the United States, by the way. Whether we be ushered in to days of grace, mercy, or days of judgment. But whoever that president is, male or female, Democrat or Republican, it is God alone who holds them in his hand to execute according to his will and his intention for America. And I want to say something to you today, and some of you may not click with me when I say this, but I really believe I'm right. Do not identify grace or judgment by a candidate or a party. We identify grace and judgment by the sovereign will of a holy God for this nation called America. Amen. You say, well, how do we get that? I mean, what, what does that mean? Does that mean we don't have a place? No, we have a mighty place. We have an incredible place of what we can do. I want to say to every one of us, God seemingly works constantly in Scripture when he sees his people being what his people need to be. When his people are doing what his people ought to be doing. So I want to say to you today, we need to be involved in our nation in every way, socially and even politically. We have been given the privilege of living in a free society in this country. Where the vote of the people determine the course of the action of our nation. Beginning right here at home, locally, regionally, statewide, and nationally. And it doesn't matter whether it's a local election a regional election, a national election, a statewide election, each one of them have implications in this global society internationally. That's why we need to understand that while some of you might need to run for public office or you might need to be really active in the political processes, but whatever your role is or whatever my role is, every one of us ought to fulfill our Christian responsibility and privilege, I might add, to go to the polls and vote, to vote, to let people know what we believe is God's will and God's intention. The most informed voters in America ought to be born-again evangelical voters. Our greatest place, however, far surpasses the voting booth. We need to see this thing from and with spiritual eyes. We need to be concerned and pray for our nation every day. Spiritually, we need to be more vigilant than ever before to advance the gospel to every person in our land and every person in the world. And you know why we need to be so concerned about this? Is because if we do not see the move of God, religious liberty will soon be lost in this country. And I'm telling you, when that happens, Things are going to change drastically all across this country. And I promise you, those days will be unprecedented to any of us in our culture. So practically and spiritually, we need to be involved in our nation. And we need to realize that God will use each one of us to help fulfill His sovereign purpose in this world. There's a second statement I want to give you about America. This might surprise some of you. I'm often asked as I go preach around the country today, you think God's given up on America? You think it's over? Think we're under judgment? I don't think there's any more hope. I mean, I get asked that all the time and told that all the time. But I want to remind people and I want to remind you today and those who are watching on television and those who are listening on the web today or watching on the web, but I want to tell all of you here today, God is working in America. And we don't need to ever forget that. He has a sovereign plan for America, but God is also working in America. He was at work in Nehemiah's day. Even when they were over in captivity, God was at work. God's always at work in our country. 
Even in the most desperate time of their persecution, God was at work. And I'm telling you, God is at work even in our most desperate day today. We live in a day and time when God is at work in the land. And the story of God that has been unfolded in Nehemiah chapter 1 and even beyond demonstrates the work of God not only in Nehemiah's day, but even in our day. And I want to I really draw some things out here for you to take home and to realize today. Let me tell you, first of all, that God is working by revealing reality. Revealing reality. Now, don't, don't, don't underserve what I just said. Don't underappreciate this whole element of revealing reality. You can't go anywhere until you know where you are at the point of beginning. And not only do people at times not have a good awareness of who they are and what their abilities are, at times nations do not have a good awareness of where we are. But let me tell you one of the great privileges God gave Nehemiah. God gave Nehemiah reality. Reality about what was happening in Jerusalem. And God revealed it to him. And God told him, your land is in trouble. Your city is a disgrace. All the security is gone and the enemies are being empowered. That's not a good message to hear anywhere. But it was reality. I believe today God is showing and giving America a reality check. In my years on this earth, which I am just a young lad compared to some of you, but I have never known days like we are living in today. Just as Nehemiah was told great trouble exists in the land, I sadly tell you today that great trouble exists in America. Lawlessness abounds. Look at it on the web. Look at it at the news times. Look at it at the talk shows. I mean, these are unprecedented days. Lawlessness is abound, and people are acting like there is no such thing as a higher authority. And they're living like there's no accountability at all. You take what happened in Colorado Springs the other day. Lawlessness. What happened in Chicago? Lawlessness. Lawlessness is abounding. Racism is erupting endlessly. That is remarkable to me that that is still happening in our day and time. I tell you today, the church of Jesus Christ should stand, should stand powerfully against racism and say, it is evil. And it is not the intent or the will of God at all. Violence. Violence is all over the world. And you think about the violence in our own nation. And then you think about our internalities as a nation. America is not following God's ways. We now believe that marriage can happen between a man and a man and a woman and a woman. And I'm just telling you, that's not what God's Word says. That life really has no viability or sanctity at all. But I'm telling you, God's Word tells us that human life has sanctity from the beginning of conception all the way until the way you are buried. And one day He'll raise it from the dead. He believes in it so much. And give it life for those of us who believe. And when you devalue the sanctity of human life, you will end up devaluing the, the privilege and the imprint of God's divine hand upon every person in this world that we are made in His image. And I want to tell you today, every person has value in this world and the church needs to lead the way, reminding America everyone has value in this world. Amen. Security is being jeopardized all across our nation. Undeniably. Immigration challenges remain. Borders are not as secure as we had hoped. ISIS is threatening and targeting our nation. 
America today is not even like the America post 911. America is facing national security threats today that are unlike anything we've ever faced in our lifetime. The enemies of America are being empowered, and America is not leading clearly. God is revealing reality. But God is also working by calling leaders. Be encouraged. God is calling leaders. When Nehemiah saw reality, the hand of God called him to go back and to do something about the situation. He did. He wept. He prayed. He mourned. He fasted over a protracted period of time, up to four months. He did these things before the Lord God, Lord God of heaven, before he did anything. And I want to tell you today, God is calling leaders to action. Spiritual leaders like pastors, he's calling us to action. Business leaders like hundreds of you here today, God is calling you to action. Political leaders like a few of you here today, God is calling you to action. And when he calls us to action, we need to lead with conviction. We need to lead with decisiveness. We need to lead with focus, and we need to lead with urgency. I'm telling you, God is calling leaders. I don't know fully what my role is in all of this. But what I do know is that God has put an enormous burden on my heart for this country. And that God has put a clear calling on my life to tell this country that the greatest need in this nation is the next great awakening in this country. And I will be vigilant in that message and I will be faithful to deliver that message. But what is your role? What is your role? I, I, I don't know fully what mine is, but what is your role? Do you realize that you have a role today? Because God is calling you to do something about where we are. And what is call it God calling you to do? I pray today that whether that role is to run for some political office or to help someone else do it, or to get involved in your town, or to get involved in your region, or our state, or across the country, I'm telling you today, just do something. Do something and see what God's role is in your life. But God is also preparing His people. I'm so thankful that God is preparing His people. I believe with all my heart, God is preparing His people. You see, His church, His church, He's calling to revival, and he's calling to restoration. And Satan, you know what he's doing? Satan is ruling. He is ruling toward ruin. And the church is facing a choice. Either the church will have revival or we'll see a reduction of who we are in this culture. We'll see a reduction of our forces here in America and around the world. His church will ultimately win, I believe, with all my heart. And the gates of hell will not prevail against this church. But I don't know about you. I don't want to live in days of judgment. I want to live in days of grace and days of glory and days of awakening. And I ask you today, relating to America, it comes down to this. It's awakening or judgment. It's one or the other. We can't, you know, put pretty Christmas paper on it and put a bow around it and feel like it's all right. I'm telling you, we are in desperate need for awakening in this nation. And God's preparing his people. I'm telling you, I, I, I have confidence God is at work. I believe personally God is calling his people to pray and to fast. I, I don't know what that means for you. I don't know what that means for me ultimately. But I believe God has got a call out to his people to pray, and to fast. I mean, when you look at chapter 1, I'm going to go through this real quickly. and I'm not going to read the text, but I want to show you something here. In verse 5, they called out to God. Verse 6, he pleaded with God day and night for his country. When is the last time have we pleaded with God day and night for our country? Some of us will watch talk show, yelling shows, endlessly about our country. 
But when's the last time have we called out to God for our country both day and night? He confessed personal sins and he confessed the sins of our nation. He repented and he called upon the nation to repent and return to God. And I'm telling you born again Christians today, we need to call upon our nation to repent and return to God. But it's a little hard for us to do that if we're not repenting ourselves and we're not leading the way in the church. Verse 10 and 11, he appealed to God for forgiveness, mercy, and restoration. Verse 11, he asked God for direction and to lead him in the right kind of action. Oh, I, I, I want to tell you today, I, I think that, that prayer is one of our greatest actions we can take. I, that doesn't mean it's our only action. It, we need to be like Nehemiah later on. With one hand, they built the wall, and with one hand, man, they were ready to go to battle. And that's what we need to do. We need to go to the battle in prayer, but on the other hand, I mean, we need to be diligent in all the challenges that we face in our country, being active, doing whatever it takes to help the next generation and to help the present generation become what God wants it to become. You see, there are two reasons why we must pray. No great work of God has ever occurred that is not first preceded by the extraordinary prayer of God's people. I've said that again and again, and I continue to echo it right here in this church today. And I've said this again and again. All across this nation, I say it to you a day again, and I've said it to you more than anybody. God can do more in a moment than we could ever do in a lifetime. That's what we need to pray. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and his righteousness. My hope is not in who's in the White House. My hope is in God's activity in the church house. And we need to believe that God has a sovereign plan for America and that God is working in America. He is revealing reality, he's calling leaders, and he's preparing his people. But there's a third and final thing that I say to you before we dismiss you today. God will accomplish his will in America. He will. I'm confident of that. I'm confident he will will accomplish his will in this country if we pray. And I'm confident he will accomplish his will in this country if we don't pray. Because I think we're giving up for days of mercy and grace or days of judgment. And I want to run to days of grace. What about you? In Nehemiah's day, God used him to restore hope. For the people of God by rebuilding the wall and securing the nation again from its enemies. But this external work only demonstrated what God was doing internally with them. Because also, here's what happened. The people came back to God. The people confessed their sin and they got right with God. They returned to the Word of God. There's an entire chapter about it in the book of Nehemiah. God responded when he heard the prayers of his leader And he heard the prayers of his people. I'm convicted today and absolutely convinced what God has done before, God is able to do again. So what must we do? We need to remember this this morning. And my people, which are called by my name, humble themselves. Pray and seek my face and turn from their evil ways. Then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin and heal their land. If my people, God's people are the hope for America, the left elite can do what they want. They're not our problem, folks. We, the church, need to get our act together. And we need to humble ourselves before God. That will take a miracle. And we need to pray. And we need to seek the face of God, meaning He needs to become the priority of our lives again. And we need to turn from our ways. And then what does God say? God said, I'm going to hear what you say to me. I'm going to forgive you where you are and for where you've been. And I'm going to heal you and I'm going to heal your land. Ladies and gentlemen and teenagers here today, I I don't know 
what to say to you any more than what is deeply on my heart today. So I'm going to say it to you. The year 2016 that we're about to walk into, unless Jesus comes or you die first, or I die first, I believe could be the most critical year in American history, especially the most critical year in your living history. And this is not a time for us to push the snooze button, be asleep, and take the lesser course and continue with inaction. Here's what I believe we need to do. We need to do what God's Word talks about. You see, when, when, if we, just, we just need to return to God. And here's what I'm going to ask you to consider in these days. It all starts with a number, but it's more than a number. And it's the number 21. 21. Think about that number, 21. It's more than a number, but it's 21 days of action, a call to action. And these 21 days begin at sunset on January the 10th and conclude in the afternoon of January the 31st. There are 21 days of prayer and fasting for your life, for our region, for our church, and for America. And 21 days of prayer and fasting at some level for many, that call may be abstinence from food for 21 days, drinking juice, water only to get you through the experience. Spending those times where you normally eat, calling out to God for those needs in our country. For some of you, it might be one meal a day during those 21 days. For some of you, maybe it's not food. Maybe it's a call to concentrated prayer for 30 minutes every day, totally for our nation, where you exit life and you just do what you abnormally never would do unless God would lead you to do it. For some of you, it might be abstinence from something that you love, from surfing the web to social networking. I don't know what it is. But I want to challenge you today, refuse apathy and refuse inaction and refuse making excuses. Now's the time to lead and now's the time to act. Hey, if we're living in truly unprecedented days in our nation, I'm telling you, it's time that we do and take unprecedented actions to match up with these days. And it's pretty obvious <laughs> we're not doing that today to turn the course. And my goal is not to win back the culture. I have no goal like that. But I'll tell you what my goal is, is to have a mighty move of God so saturate this region that it's unlike anything any of us have ever even come close to experiencing in our lives. So that your children and my children, so that all of us can experience days of grace and days of glory and days of blessing versus days of judgment and abandonment. And with the course of all that's happening in 2016, from the election of a president to the concerns that are absolutely alive in this nation and around this world, if we, the people of God, do not act, who will act? If my people. I'm saved. I'm one of my people, his people, who are called by his name. Humble ourselves. Pray. Seek his face. Turn from his wicked, our wicked ways. 
Then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin. And I will heal their land. That's where I'm banking my future. And that's the sovereign plan of God that I so desire for this land. It's time for us to have a serious conversation with God about America.